Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we are recording this webinar. Wonderful. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good day to everybody. Um, my name is Jim Walker. I am the uh, VP of Product Marketing here at Cockroach Labs. Uh, and I'm coming to you today from Denver, Colorado. Beautiful day. So, um, you know, we, we have a database that um, is cloud native. Um, a database that was really built and, and architected on some really kind of core, you know, distributed principles that I think, you know, have a, have, have an impact on kind of the way that all of us think about our applications and services as, as we kind of move to the cloud and we deploy applications. And so I'm hoping that this talk today, while an overview of Cockroach database, um, also opens uh, eyes to some, some special ways about thinking about data and thinking about systems in a distributed world and the way that we approach these things. Um, you know, people often ask us, you know, what kind of, what level is this? It's a little bit more immediate, you know, I'm not gonna be hands-on code, um, but it's definitely not gonna be kind of 10,000 foot level either. We're gonna, we're gonna dive into the weeds. We're gonna talk about Raft, we're gonna talk about which is a distributed consensus protocol. We're going to talk about uh, you know distributed transactions and how you think about that and distributed system and the data, uh, multi-version concurrency control, another really kind of important algorithm to think about um, as we build out these distributed systems. Um, the effect of the speed of light on on what we do, which as you move towards being distributed, you no longer think about a single location. You have to think about you know multiple, and and the speed of light's no joke. We can't beat it uh, at this. At this point, at least, I, you know, from what I understand, we still can't uh, get past that. I, I, I can't wait until we do, but I don't know if I'll see that in my lifetime, but, but still, so we have to deal with the speed of light and, and how do we do that? And then we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that we're doing in transaction pipelining, some more advanced topics um, in Cockroach. And, and hopefully throughout the way, this is valuable to you more than just a introduction and kind of a under the covers into what Cockroach database does. Uh, and, and I hope it opens eyes from, from a development point of view of kind of what these things are. Now, by way of introduction, yeah, I mean, this is purely architected for the cloud. This is not something that was like, you know, lift and shift, let's take Oracle and run it in a container in the cloud. You know, let's kind of deploy Mongo in a way that is kind of in a cloud and distributed, but not totally cloud native, not like, not aligned with, you know, some of the core principles. Uh, I think a lot of them are in there. Um, but but how do we actually deal with you know these things in, in broadly distributed environments? It's not it's not move and improve. It's not take something, change one piece of it to make distributed. There is an emergence of a of a group of of databases that that are truly distributed. And we we think about distributed systems. Looking at the code bases of of these systems, I think is 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 truly uh, valuable. I I like to think of the code base of of Cockroach database as almost a PhD in distributed systems. Um, and it's all open, it's, it's all open source. So, you know, our Git repo, if you, if you code and go, uh, it's an extra bonus because it's, it's all go code. So um, it, it is, it is a, a great implementation. You know, things that we do uh, in Cockroach, you know, get contributed upstream, like, you know, our raft implementation is, has had many, you know, um, PRs posted against, you know, etcd and etcd raft which is kind of a core component of, of kubernetes as well you know some of the things that we're running into in terms of you know being truly multi-master in those type of environments these these broadly distributed environments where the speed of light actually does have an impact on on how quickly things are actually committing uh in in, in places in etcd uh and, and and how we use raft like for atomic replication you know we've contributed that stuff upstream and so you know, I look at those projects as kind of the, the core kind of components that I, I think are great for people to learn a lot about distributed systems and, and how to code these things. I always learn through code, so I, I find it to be the best way to go. So, um, but this is truly cloud native. This is, you know, it's, it's distributed SQL, um, you know, the category, which, you know, Matt Aslett, who's an analyst at 451 Group about eight or nine years ago, started calling the space new SQL. And actually last week or two weeks ago or something, he published new uh, research finding where he actually has just agreed this is distributed SQL. It, it's more descriptive of, of what these databases are doing. And, and for me, there's really kind of five key requirements to be distributed SQL. Number one, well, it's got to be SQL. We're, we're not talking about a new language. Um, let, let's, let's let it work. Let's be familiar and let it work with all the things we already use. Um, you have to build scale into the system. That's a core principle of, of distributed systems. It has to, you have to build for resilience in the system, not around it. Don't, don't surround it with technology 
to make it resilient and, and make it available all everywhere, right? I think that's one of the, another core principle, two of them actually. Resilience, make it available and make it available everywhere. Uh, uh, and then, you know, if we're gonna be a, a relational kind of database in this new world, um, you know, having transactions and, and, and uh, you know, understanding guarantees around consistency also really important. And then tying data location is the only way that we're gonna be able to get past the speed of light. Period, um, and and lock, stock, and barrel, um, a, a core kind of concept. You know, when you when you think about a database and a distributed system, um, I, we we have lots of conversations with people around this in our in our community and within our customers. You know, typically when you deploy a database, you know, you're going to prop up Postgres or whatever, and you know, you're going to think about tables and columns and referential integrity and you know, and, and you're just going to architect your 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 logical data model. What's interesting when you move towards distributed systems and, and in distributed SQL, you have to start thinking about the physical model and, and, and how do we simplify the physical model so that you know, data does live closest to the user? Um, how do we disperse data throughout a cluster so that I can survive the failure of, of a node or a rack, an entire availability zone or a region, or for that matter, maybe a Kubernetes cluster? And so you got to start thinking about latency and, and, and resilience and, and what you want to survive when you're in distributed systems, because that's what this is all about. And I think this is where we're headed with, with everything from a cloud native point of view. And I think these are the core concepts that I feel really kind of define um, distributed SQL. Now, as a quick overview, um, let me just run through really quickly. This is how we talk about Cockroach at a very high level. And I'm going to get really deep in the reads really quick, OK? You know, Cockroach, and I'll come back to that. Cockroach is a cloud native database. It's a relational database. It, we built an interface on this, which is wire compatible with Postgres. So this is just the familiar SQL database that we're all kind of used to for these kind of, you know, these transactional workloads, heavy read, write transactional workloads. I think when Kubernetes first started, it was like, oh, it's for stateless. And how do we do state? And I, I just think of you know, every application has a database typically, right? So um, this is a database that was really built and architected for this new world. In fact, Cockroach database uh, is, is spawn of Spanner. Um, you know, we, are, we actually uh, built off of the Google Cloud Spanner white paper, which, you know, you know if you look at, you know, Jeff Dean and, and Sanjay Gemawat and Eric Brewer and all they've done at Google and what they've contributed to the world's it's phenomenal. You know, we took one of that paper and we built it so that it's, it's available everywhere. In fact, Kelsey, who's kind of a luminary in the Kubernetes space, some of you may know him. Uh, he tweeted this, it was a couple of years ago, Cockroach D is the spanner as Kubernetes is the Borg. Uh, we are very well aligned with Kubernetes and I think that's a core kind of piece, right? But also it's just basically a relational database. This is a series of nodes. All we do to scale the database, we spin up a node, point it at the cluster and the database takes care about distribution of data. Every node in Cockroach can accept both reads and writes. Every node is an endpoint, which is another critical point. We'll talk about that in a bit. We can scale within a single region. We can actually scale across multiple regions. This could be multiple clusters. Um, and, and how do you implement a single logical database across multiple different clusters? So don't federate you know, the clusters, just manage each one of those. Maybe we just federate at the data layer, right? And so I know those people who are interested in kind of federation of Kubernetes this is very, very interesting, but we can also do this cross clouds. Uh, we can have multi-region, but it can be multi-cloud as well. I can have now a single logical database where any endpoint can access data across the entirety of the database that's deployed across three different cloud providers, which I believe is truly phenomenal. Um, and one of those things that really, really excites me about, about Cockroach. Um, it's naturally resilient, right? We can survive the failure of a node or a rack, an AZ, an entire region. It just depends on how we distribute data within the cluster, right? Because we're actually writing data in triplicate. So in this case, maybe have one copy of data in each different cluster so that if one, one cluster goes down, I still have a remaining two copies of that data. Um, we can change the replication factor. And, and really this, this distribution of data comes down to you know, how you actually want to get data closest to latency for, for access and resilience. And we're doing it at the row level in Cockroach. And we'll, we'll show you that as well. Again, every node is an endpoint. I can ask for data if I'm on say the US West cluster and it's gonna be able to find that data say on a US East cluster. Um, but I can also do things like, I can also do things like, you know, I'm gonna ask for data on the East Coast and well, I'm gonna make sure that data is closest to users. So I can actually, uh, you know, deal with that um, 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 
the, the speed of light, right? And so get data very, very close to users. Uh, people love this as well. If you start thinking about the, the sovereignty laws that are in place and data privacy, you know, can I have data that is, you know, German data live in German servers? And so that's just all part of the setup in Cockroach. So we can start to help with some of these complex data compliance uh, regulations that are going out there as well, right? So, okay, so let's get into the details, right? So that was about, I don't know, I guess I guess I did about nine minutes as an intro and probably about five on on, on like the, the top level of Cockroach. I, go out and try it is the best way. I mean, Cockroach DB core, which is the open source version, you go download and start, you know, dealing with yourself, uh, you know, go into Cockroach cloud and spin up a cluster and start playing with this today if, if you want to, right? Okay, so great. Now, how do we do all this? You know, ultimately, I think of every database in three layers. I think there is a, a communication or a language, right? There is a, you know, how do I interact with that? And to me, that's just SQL. You know, we made a choice a long time ago to be wire compatible with Postgres. And we've done a lot of work to, to build out that SQL syntax so that it is familiar for people. I, I don't know. I learned SQL in college. And so I've been, I've been speaking SQL my whole life. At the very bottom layer is the storage layer. How does, you know, ultimately a database is actually going to write to disk at some point, right? Like, that's the whole point, um, storing data. And then in between the, the language and the storage is the execution. You know, every transaction, you know, select star from customer, well, that's going to get broken down into, say, three different um, transactions, this, uh, you know, a, a start, the transaction itself, and then a commit. More complex queries get broken down into lots of different transactions underneath, right? And, and the database actually does that for us. For us, you know, mere mortals, we don't think about the transactions inside unless you're optimizing queries, you're a DBA, these sort of things. But uh, when you're building a database, this is where things can go awry. Uh, if it was easy, easy to build a database, everybody would be doing it, but it's all the corner cases across all the different types of transactions and, and issues that can happen where, where things get really, really interesting. And so doing this in a distributed system creates some significant challenges from an architecture point of view. Now, ultimately at the lowest layer, at the storage layer, Cockroach is implemented as a, a KV store. It's, it's a, a Cockroach database actually is a database on top of a database. Um, you know, Cockroach uses something called Pebble, PebbleDB. Um, and Pebble is something that actually we built and launched about a year ago. We originally built on something called Rocks. Um, and we actually rebuilt Rocks basically, um, refactored it some for, for, for some interesting things that we need to do around multi-tenancy and whatnot. Um, but we rewrote it in Go. Uh, and so uh, that's a KV store that, that is the lowest layer of Cockroach. And ultimately for Cockroach, every table, every row is, is really kind of ordered as this monolithic logical key space, right? So you could think of this dogs table and here we are alphabetically for all the dogs, that's the keys, right? And so everything is basically ordered, every single table. Now in a traditional database, the way this works, say you have an inventory table, you know, every time I wanted to write something, glove, ball, shirt, shoes, bat, shoes, if I wanted to write ball again, I would append another record at the bottom of this, this, this storage, right? For the inventory and I use a, an index to actually access these things quickly. This is the traditional model, right? And this is kind of the structured data. Now, structured data to me is elegant, right? Structured data to me is what allows us to model a database. Like, when you start to deal with like JSON objects and this sort of stuff or a document model database, once you get above 10, 12 objects, making changes to these structures become really kind of difficult, right? Because, you know, you're actually relying on the translation of these things in other places and not in the database itself. Let the database maintain the structure. And so for us, having this kind of relational structure is a kind of a core foundational component of what we're doing. Uh, but, but how do we take this and, and approach it in a different way so that we can actually be distributed. And so ultimately, like I said, we're a KV store underneath. Now, this tabular data is all stored in this order. And then basically we're using a KV peer, KV pair, where the K is the name of the table, the index, uh, the key and column name. And then the value is actually the column value. So let me just show you how this works, right? So here's this simple dogs table. We have ID, name and weight, the simple DDL. There's some entries over on the right-hand side. And so let's just look at this table. Here's four entries. These things get broken down into two records in the KV store, right? I first have the table name. Here's the key, which is the ID here, I guess, 34. And then the column is going to be name, and that value is Carl. And then I have, you know, the table, the dog. The ID is 34. The column name is weight. That value is 10.1. 
Now, what we're doing is every single row gets broken out like this. Now we're encoding the key down into, you know, into hex so that we actually have some really, really, you know, wonderful, uh, you know, sorting going on and whatnot. Um, very, very quick sorting. But, but ultimately, if you look at this, like if you look at the keys, they, they are ordered. Now, when we want to insert something, we know exactly where to insert this into the table based on the key and everything is always going to be ordered. And Cockroach, um, in the meanwhile, manages all of this in the background. This is just all happening unbeknownst to, you know, the developer who's just writing a SQL query, right? Um, and we're doing this because it allows us for massive efficiencies in, in the way that we sort data and allows us to distribute data in a very, very intelligent way, right? We're going to take this, this, this range, right? We're going to take this entire table and we're going to break it down in these contiguous kind of 512 megabit ranges. Right? We just upgraded this from 256 to 512 recently. Um, these ranges are small enough so that we can actually, you know, move them quickly while, while making sure that the overhead of an index to find these things is, is appropriate from a performance point of view as well. So let's take this table. We're going to break it down into three ranges. You know, we have Carl through Jack, Lady through Petey, Pine Top through Z. These are all my friend's dog's names, honestly. So, um, and so what we have to do to find these different ranges, well, we actually create an index structure. And that index structure is implemented very much like a B tree, if you're familiar with that, that algorithm and how that works, right? But that's how we actually find these ranges so that when I want to insert a record, I talk to the index, it knows where to find it. It's in that red range, great. I go to the red range. The red range says, yeah, I have space, I'm good. Insert that record, wonderful. Sunny is now inserted into there. What happens when I want to now insert another record into that range? I want to insert Rudy, okay, great. I didn't have space, so it says, okay, let me split that. Let me create a new color range and I'm gonna make all this extra space, now I have space. Now, this seems really simple, but it's really complex to do, but ultimately the value here is, you don't have to worry about horizontal sharding anymore. We've just done this. These ranges can be thought of as shards or tablets, and the database is just basically automatically doing all this. There's no like layer around MySQL or Postgres. This is literally at the storage layer of the database as well. So optimize from performance, and more importantly, from a distribution point of view. So being truly cloud native, cloud native and architected from the ground up to do this is actually paramount. Let's not just reuse MySQL and, and allow that to happen and, and amortize this, this, this range splitting and whatnot above MySQL instances. Let's actually go in and rework the database at the storage layer to do that. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Now, we use Raft uh, extensively in Cockroach. Um, if you're not familiar with Raft, it's a pretty important um, protocol or algorithm, I should say. If you're doing distributed systems, I really think it's a, an important thing to actually understand. Um, and really it's, it's a distributed consensus algorithm that allows us to provide these atomic writes and consistent reads. So um, uh, actually somebody's asking, how is data integrity taken care of? For example, updating the same row from two different nodes and locations. Um, we're gonna actually, I'm gonna show you actually how we do that in a, in a second, okay? so. Um, I'll, I'll show you exactly how we how we go through that, and and, and it's a combination of Raft and MVCC is is the algorithms that 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 are in here, and, and a lot of really magic stuff that you know our software engineers built out, right? So so Raft. Um, that was a question in the QA, you all. Sorry, I didn't I didn't actually tell you what was going on. Sorry, my bad. Um, Raft is a distributed consensus protocol. It allows us to have these atomic writes and consensus and consistent reads across a distributed system. Now, Raft is implemented as a, a series of replicas, right? So within the Raft protocol, there's this concept of a replica set or a group of, of, of replicas, right? So here you have, remember that blue range that was on the last, I think it had muddy in it, right? I have three replicas of that range. Um, we can do it as five, seven, nine. It's gotta be odd. It's an odd number of replicas because we're gonna actually get something called quorum writes. And this, this is related to the, the question that was in the QA, right? When we write something to one of these replicas, we're gonna make sure that it's gonna be right because two of three of the replicas are gonna be ensured that this is gonna have, you know, the right data in it, right? And, and we're gonna get that quorum, that quorum right. Now, there's this concept of a raft leader. The leader is, is elected amongst the, the, the three different participants, and then the other two are followers. The raft leader is a special uh, node or a special range, if you will. Um, it does handle all kind of authoritative updates uh, and, and, and is kind of the, 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 the system of record, I guess, for that, for, that, for that replica set. So it's a really important piece. Um, and then this allows us to do atomic replication because we could say, hey, look at raft leader. 
insert this data into your range and, and it's going to make sure that it happens and, and it's going to be correct across the entire group, right? It's going to ensure that consistency happens because you know, two of three actually commit, the third one's got to come along and the raft leader is always going to be right. Now, if you want to learn more about raft, there's this really wonderful website. I don't know who did this, but I just want to thank them personally. Um, it's called the secret lives of data. Um, it's one of these, I think it's, if you go check it out, it's pretty straightforward, but it gets much deeper into the protocol. I'm just giving a, a quick high level overview in the context of what we're doing. And the QR code there should work for you. Um, if, if you're interested in going out and getting that. And, and again, this presentation of slides will be available afterwards. So, okay. So now that I've gone through raft, I've gone through kind of the storage layer and, and how we're actually breaking things out into ranges so that we can store that in a, in KV, right? Um, we've talked a little bit about Raft. Now, how do we use Raft to actually distribute data? Um, well, when we, when we replica data in a cluster, we actually want to think about, you know, we, we want flexible options, right? We want to have, you know, kind of different signals that are going to power how we actually move data around and where data lives within this distributed environment, right? And so, you know, one of the things we think about is, is typically diversity or kind of balance and utilization of, of say, say storage across a cluster. And so, you know, I think the most simple way of thinking about this, we'll take this range, uh, we'll take this raft group, right? The first one, we'll write it in three, or these are four um, physical nodes over there on the right-hand side. We'll, we'll write the first uh, raft group across three. We'll write the second one. We'll write the third one. Now I've evenly distributed this data across uh, four different nodes. Now this could be nine, it could be 15, it could be a hundred, if you will, right? And so Cockroach is gonna be smart enough to just evenly distribute this data based on what we wanna actually, um, you know, what we wanna actually, uh, you know, either survive or, or how fast we wanna get access to, to, to users information. One of the other heuristics that we look at, we look at load, you know, like let's say this, this middle range, Lady, Lula, Muddy, and PD is really, really popular because, you know, Muddy, my dog is the best dog ever uh, and everybody wants access, right? So I'm joking, um, you know, so we can actually, you know, uh, uh, write those ranges on nodes that are less busy so that we can actually say, hey, look at, you know, we have this range, it's a little hot, let's, let's isolate it off on a node so it can actually, you know, it's not going to hurt the performance of the database because, you know, lots of things are kind of in conflict on a particular node, right? <clears throat> so we'll, we'll do that as well, which I think is kind of cool. And we're using heuristics all the time in the database to actually deal with this. Uh, one second, let me just make sure this is going away. All right, yeah, so, and then we're, so that's by load. And then finally, um, we can also do things and, and do something really special something we call geo partitioning, which is a low level kind of concept in the database. But what this does, it allows us to write data to a particular location. When you spin a node up in Cockroach, you name that node, right? And, and you, you define it as living in a region or a set of nodes that are kind of logically kind of composed together, right? So you could imagine here, I have three of them. I have, you know, US West, US East, and maybe EMEA. Uh, over in Portugal, and I have three nodes in each. Now, what I can do is at the table level, at the row level, I can kind of overload the key, right? And I can add a column to the key. So I can add, like say country code was in each one of these dog records and there was EU as the country code. Now, if I overload that on the K and the KV, right? And this is that what I went through at the very beginning. Now, when I, or, when I order everything, well, all the records that have EU are kind of at the top. Everything US East is in the middle, everything. And so what we're doing is we're now ordering this, this lexicographically ordered KV set using data that's actually in, in, in each row. And now I can say at the table level, hey, I want all records that, are, that have this in the key to actually live on servers that are in a particular location. Now that's some really magic stuff. And this comes back and this ties together kind of what we're doing at the storage layer with Raft and how we're actually distributing this data and, and where it actually lives and the rules that we actually live and that we use in the database to actually do this. So it's a pretty cool concept and, 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 and enabled by kind of lots of things that were going on um, across the entirety of the, of the architecture of the database. So uh, we can do things like we scale, right? So how do I just, how do I scale this out? So when a, if I spin up a node and point it at a cluster, Cockroach is smart enough to understand like, oh, wait, I have this new node, I have new capacity. Um, what will happen is, is it'll rebalance the data. Um, it'll start moving ranges around. Uh, you don't have to do anything, it just does this. So again, 
horizontal scale without any work, uh, which I think is pretty phenomenal. And no need to actually worry about application code logic, uh, application logic dealing with new shards. You just asking a node for data, it's, it's going to find that within that within that cockroach cluster. We can also survive the failure of a, of a node itself, right? So, oh my gosh, this, this raft group, my blue raft group here is missing one of its, its partners. And it's like, oh my gosh, get this thing back. So it's smart enough to understand that I've lost one of my, one of my replicas in my replica set, the three copies, and it's gonna create a new one somewhere else in the, within the cluster itself. Now that's pretty cool as well, right? And so, but we can also survive these kind of smaller failures when you know there's like a small, little hiccup in time, you know, we'll just actually use logs to catch things back up. The raft leader makes sure that all the replicas are right all the time. And it'll just basically replay and make sure things get back to back in order um, across all the replicas. Now, this is really cool in terms of scale and resilience. I think another feature of, of distributed systems, and when I think about Kubernetes and pods and how we actually deploy, you know, compute, you know, automating uh, rolling upgrades within a system is also pretty cool. And Cockroach was built for that, right? Like this, this whole concept to be able to spin a node down and spin it back up. Uh, and it's, it's going to be able to do this scale and resilience. Uh, and it's just going to basically survive those, those sort of small failures. Well, I can just bring a node down and bring it back up with a different version of the software. I think we're backwards compatible up to two major versions, which is, I know, a year, a year and a half sometimes. I, so I think Cockroach can actually do that too. So, so these kind of rolling upgrades is another kind of key, kind of cool thing. And, and I think if you, if you design your, your application correctly, you too should be able to get rolling upgrades, right? So if you build scale into the system, if you build resilience, resilience into the system and it's automated so that it actually just understands as a single entity that if I've lost something, I could actually come back from that. Well, then you're gonna be able to get to this concept of rolling upgrades, which is really, really super powerful. Um, especially as, as we get to production and we want, you know, always on, always available services, no matter where they're at on the planet, right? So uh, another kind of core concept. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick glass, quick, quick drink of water. So let's talk about transactions. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a question in the QA about transactions. How do we ensure consistency of transactions? You know, this is not something that's very simple to do. I mean, if you have a database and you have, you know, a transaction happening in Sydney and you have a transaction happening in New York and it's all happening against the same account or the same customer record, who wins? Um, I'm gonna go through that. I'm gonna go through MVCC and actually how we actually deal with these kind of conflicts. You know, what it's gonna mean to you, the developer, is that sometimes you have to actually wrapper things with try catch blocks. It's probably a best practice anyway. I was a hack programmer. I never did that sort of thing, but but that's kind of what we're doing. But, but we're gonna guarantee in Cockroach, um, we're gonna guarantee serializable isolation, which is the top level of isolation in the database. If you're not familiar with isolation levels, by the way, don't be, I wouldn't be surprised. And a lot of developers don't even think about this stuff. Um, it actually gets, it's pretty important. When you start thinking about, you know, the things that can go wrong in a database, you know, like a non-repeatable read or, a dirty read, a phantom read. Um, there's lots of issues that can go on with your data. And, you know, as we've seen, you know, deep hacks coming in from all over the planet, thinking about these things in your database actually becoming more and more important, uh, I think, you know, as, as we get into this kind of more global environment. And so I think isolation levels are, are really, really critical. Um, so how do we then implement these distributed transactions, right? We're going to we're going to optimize for isolation level serializable, and we're going to optimize for the speed of light here, right? And so, so what are we doing, right? So, well, at the at the core, I, I just talked through this basically. I mean, at the core of every database is acid, right? Atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. What we're talking about here really is the I, the isolation level um, in in our database, right? And so, well, and this is kind of how we do it. This is a quick walkthrough. Um, let's do something that just works. I'm not going to get into the corner cases where things can go wrong, but I'll show you a little bit how we actually do that, right? So. Here's a simple transaction. I want to insert these two records into the dog table. My ranges have been dispersed across, you know, uh, these four physical nodes that we've been working with before. And so I'm going to ask any one of these nodes to insert this record. Now I've purposely drawn this gateway as, as, as green because it matches the green nodes that are over the left. Remember, any node in Cockroach can be an endpoint. I can ask any node to do this. Now it's going to find you know, the, the, the raft leader for this particular, the, for this particular range that I want to insert this, this first part of the transaction, Sunny. And that range is going to actually create a, a special kind of system record that's basically saying we have a pending transaction on this range. And what it's going to do, it's going to go communicate with its followers and say, hey, followers, 
write this, but write it with like a temporary record status. And as soon as one of those followers comes back, because I need two of three, right? Because I'm going to be guaranteed, right? Well, as soon as one of them comes back, it's like, great, go on to the next step. I can go on and I can actually start the second. And look at this, this acknowledgement trailed. And I already started the second step here, the second transaction, right? Now I'm going to write Aussie. It's going to go out. It's going to do the same thing. As soon as I get something back, it's going to return an acknowledgement. Now this range and the raft leader has now set this transaction to commit. It's going to communicate back within the gateway itself. It's the transaction is going to finalize and I can send acknowledgement back to the originating user that actually asked for me to insert these two records into the database. So that's kind of how it works, right? Like, and so that's how ranges are used um, in the context of a transaction. Now you could imagine complex transactions and the amount of ranges that are going on and Cockroach is gonna handle and deal with kind of movement and, and kind of placement of all this different data and, and when these transactions are gonna occur. Now, there's something special, um, another kind of core kind of con concept in distributed systems. If you're not familiar with multi-version concurrency control, um, I think it's a pretty cool algorithm. Uh, you know, funny enough, I, I find the, the Wikipedia version of this to be pretty valuable, actually, uh, you know, if you want to go read how this actually works. But think of this as the, how we get the isolation level in, in our asset transactions in a distributed system. So I'm just going to walk through the algorithm really quickly. Now, again, look at, like me talking about this seems pretty simple. You know, kudos to our engineering team and, and, and how they've implemented it, right? Because actually implementing this in a single system is difficult. Doing it in a distributed system is, is truly tremendous. And so I'm going to walk through a very high level version of this. But again, you know, if you're really interested in seeing how we did it, go check out our code. Um, again, all available to people. So, so in, a, in, in MVCC, there's kind of three base components. There's a transaction, there's a timestamp, and then there's the object of, of this, uh, that we want to actually affect, right? And so when a transaction occurs, basically what we do is at time zero, great. I have created a timestamp for this transaction uh, at zero, and I'm going to actually say, write this data to this object. Now, the object gets this, and this is arbitrary time. This isn't seconds. It's just basically steps, right? What the first thing it does, the object has two timestamps. It has a read timestamp and it has a write timestamp. And what the object says is like, hey, wait, a write came in. Let me tell you exactly when the write for this write came in. The last write came in at 01. Now, now what it does is it says, hey, let me create this temporary object because I, I wanna always be in a good state. Like the object should always be in a good state. But if I'm doing work in the object, create a temporary object. And so I'm gonna go write that data. And then, and then the time it took to actually do everything and bring everything back to the original object, right? And my temp object and bring it back, took about two seconds to say. And, and now I have a read timestamp. So basically the work I did is now up to date and that read timestamp is at three. And I can send the acknowledgement back to the originating transaction and say, everything's good, right? So what's cool is each row now has this read timestamp and a write timestamp. So you'll see the write timestamp is still the last time a write came in and then the read was when it fully committed it and went good, okay? So let's do this again. Okay, so great, we'll start again. We're gonna write timestamp to one. I'm gonna create this temporary object. And now while I'm doing work in this temporary object, cause I want the original object to be right, correct? You know, I want it to be correct, I should say, not right. Another transaction comes in and it says, hey, I wanna write this data. But my, now my timestamp for transaction two is two seconds. And what it's gonna say is like, wait a second, your two seconds is actually greater than the read timestamp. So wait a second second, this can't work because I haven't finished doing something else yet, right? And so in the time it took me to do that, another thing came in, you need to deal with this, right? Now we're just going to say, hey, basically, this, I have to reject this transaction because this stuff didn't work. So this is on a single object. Imagine this going across 15 different, well, I might have to roll back and do all these different things, right? So we've actually done all this in the database to actually handle this sort of thing. Now, this is for a row of data in Cockroach. This is, this, this is a very generic algorithm that as we think about data, as we think about code in our systems, how are we dealing with these sort of complex in distributed systems? Because anybody could be asking an object for, for data at any one time, right? And so this is a, a kind of a really critical kind of core algorithm um, in distributed systems that I feel is kind of cool and, and pretty awesome. Now, long story short, you know, it's like standing in a line, um, you know, every transaction happens in order and ensures that, that, you know, the, the till isn't going to be out of order. But, but then again, I'm just a marketing guy. Um, this is a kind of a top level understanding of, of how this stuff works, right? So, 
Okay, so uh, let's go now to SQL execution. So actually there was a question that came in the chat. Are there any locks that are put when someone is accessing a row or range of rows for DML operations? Um, well, that kind of was covered in how we actually deal with transactions. There's this kind of special, hey, there's a transaction pending. So um, that's how we actually do that. And then, you know, we're using MVCC to, to, to ensure that that consistency is gonna happen throughout. Um, and then another really great question here was, what's the minimum number of nodes needed to have a database up and running? You know, I think it's one or three, uh, in my opinion, you could do two, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Because if you're gonna have replicas, three replicas, you know, you want them across three places or, or maybe it's just all on one and you don't care about the resilience, right? And so I think that's kind of one of those cool things, but typically four is, is typically the best chance because you can survive the failure of one node going down you're always going to be secure and, 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 and be resilient. Um, typically, we'll see people do three or four in, in multiple regions. You know, if you want to survive multiple regions, they'll do like four in the west, four in the east, you know, four in the central, whatever that is. Um, it really depends on what you want to accomplish with the database. You know, I, I think the easiest way to do this is just use Cockroach Cloud and, and let us manage kind of how that all works and, 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 and help you accomplish your goals, right? So... Okay, so now uh, distributed SQL execution. So again, you know, we've talked about the KV layer. Now let's talk about how we can actually push down compute to each of the, the where the data lives as well uh, and decompose queries so that we're actually distributing this sort of stuff. I like to think about this, you know, I was originally, um, you know, I was at a company called Hortonworks and, you know, this whole concept of MapReduce actually originated at, at Google as well. I mean, this is another, you know, Jeffrey Dean and Sanjay Gemawat uh, white paper around MapReduce, but the core concepts that were there were actually applied in Spanner and then are applied here as well, right? And so, you know, this isn't like, let's let's coordinate MySQL instances or let's coordinate, you know, Postgres instances. No, we, this is a complete rework to be distributed of the execution layer of the database. Now there's significant benefits in doing so from definitely from a performance point of view. More importantly, what does distributed mean when we get into kind of cost-based optimization and costs of, of transactions? You know, how are we actually going to optimize the database over time? And so, you know, reworking and re-architecting not just the storage layer, not just the language, but really, really this execution layer, and not wrappering different executions with this stuff is, is really critical and something we've done. So let's take a simple query. We're going to count, um, you know, we're going to count the number of countries uh, across my customer table, right? And what I do is I just basically take that query, I push it down to uh, one of my nodes. It's actually gonna perform a scan locally there. We're gonna do scans locally in each of the regions. We're gonna take that data. We're gonna do the group by in each of those regions. We're gonna send that data back, right? Map and then reduce, right? Bring it back and then result uh, and then send results back to the, 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 the original requester. Now, again, uh, we use this uh, and, and chose to redo everything ultimately because we could do cost-based optimization uh, in this. And I think if you're, if you're familiar with, you know, traditional databases, CBO is such a critical piece and, and kind of a, a core thing of, of how we actually deal with these uh, uh, improving optim of, of transactional Oh man, sub, oh my God, I'm totally, our P99 latency is under five milliseconds. How are you gonna do that? Uh, and so we, we, we work really hard to help you do those sort of things, right? Okay, now let's talk about latency. Um, I've got about 20 minutes left. I've probably got about 10 more, 15 more minutes of, of stuff here, maybe 12, I'll make it 12, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about latency and let's kind of see how these things kind of, let's take a step back and kind of come back up again. Um, you, know, you know, back in the day when you built applications, you had a server and a database, for me, man, it was so long ago. This stuff all lived in actually one single box, uh, but then you have a database server and application server, but, but it was like, you know, literally you had ethernet between the two. It was really super fast, right? Um, but what's happened is, you know, we are distributed and people are all over the place, you know, now we have, we're dealing with, with users that, you know, the speed of light is actually, you know, a, a thing here, right? So around trip times of 12 milliseconds or 70 milliseconds, when you're doing that across multiple different transactions can be an issue. Um, but we also do things in our implementations today um, to, to cope with outages, right? And, and how do we do backups? And how do we have a secondary primary or a primary and secondary, you know, database so that I have failover, right? This has been this active passive system that we've had in place for years, decades, right? And so, you know, this, this active passive way to me is a thing of the past. And, and I think it comes out of, again, 
kind of core principles in distributed systems where everything is active. How do you make everything active? An active, active database for us, but how do you make sure that every one of your nodes and in, in your compute nodes and what you're actually building out are active, right? And, and let's not have failover systems because they're just a waste. Um, they aren't used, it waste, it's wasted capacity. There's just lots of reason. And, and honestly, asynchronous replication is only gonna be so good because again, you're dealing with speed light and, and things aren't always out of, uh, aren't always on sync. In fact, what happens when the primary goes down and you bring up the secondary and then the primary comes back on, how do you mitigate you know, the differences between those two? Lots of different problems with kind of this active passive system, right? You know, for something that's more of an active active system, what you're doing is you're taking smaller instances and deploying them in many different places. You know, for us, let's have five different regions so that we're going to guarantee that we're going to be sub, you know, 40 millisecond round trip times, no matter what happens across each one of these things. So that when a user access data, say in New York, they could go at US East, we're going to have about a 24 millisecond read. Uh, over on the west side, over on the west coast, maybe there's an Arizona person there. They're getting something back in about 32 seconds, right? Or yeah, it's about 32 seconds, right? 31, right? So, but what happens when an entire region goes out? Well, again, remember if we've distributed the data correctly across this, these, 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 these regions, well, that user in Arizona can just redirect and go against the U.S. West, and actually. Man, look at those round trip times are about the same, right? And so we actually haven't really, really even lost anything, right? And so there's, there's just ways of dealing with kind of these, these latencies and outages that, that get really, really important when you have this active, active system. Now, I think active passive is interesting as well from a backup and restore point of view. You know, I think that's one of the reasons why we have this is backup, you know. But in a distributed system, you know, why is, would you back up everything to like say one big, server that's sitting in Oklahoma. No, you want to actually do distributed backup and restore. So you have, you know, this, this, this the same way you have a distributed system for, you know, servicing queries, these read writes through every node, you actually want distributed backup as well. And so uh, that's how you actually deal with this within something like an, an active, active system. But again, another core principle, another thing to think about as we go distributed, you know, think about all the other things that have to be distributed that go with those things. I think that's one of those big complexities is as we move, for, move forward towards this kind of distributed mindset and distributed thinking. Um, I, you know, I, our last release, we made this pretty simple to, to actually implement. Um, you know, we, we've boiled down this whole like where data lives and how we actually deploy uh, a database across multiple regions down to four simple DDL statements. You know, we're defining cluster regions um, and then we're placing a database within those regions, right? So. We're going to start a node and place it in a region and then we're going to say hey this database has a primary region of east and then there's west and central so that's where data is going to live we can basically change goals of survival to be regional failure or maybe it's a availability zone failure uh, and then we can actually do this down at the real level i'm not going to get too deep into this but lots of great stuff in our documentation on exactly how this stuff works we have really simplified configuration of the database itself down to four simple DDL statements, which is pretty, pretty impressive work by the team here and, and pretty, you know, it, I'm still in awe of it. Um, but again, I think our docs does a great job of, of describing this and other kind of some of the principles that, that I've gone through here. So, okay, so last topic, distributed performance optimization. So this one's a bit more, uh, even even more academic and even more down in the weeds. But I think one of, again, one of these things that, you know, thinking about distributed systems and think about latencies, how do you actually deal with, you know, the speed of transactions, right? And so we're doing things, we're doing lazy transactions and we're also doing right pipelining, right? And so let's look at, first of all, let's look at lazy and pipeline together. So the, here's our transaction. We're gonna write these two records and we're gonna commit it, right? Insert into table two records, right? And so in a serial way, we start the transaction, uh, Carl comes back, okay, Carl gets written, it comes back, start the second, right, it's, it's you know, the second, right, transaction, begin is transaction, Carl, Nigel, right, we're just doing the four things. Nigel comes back, and then the commit is going to come back with the keys, and we're going to come back. This take a total amount of, you know, one, one, two, three, four round trips. Now with lazy and pipelining, what we're doing is we're actually gonna write Carl, we're gonna write Nigel, and both of those things are gonna come back. Then we're just gonna simply commit this and come back, right? So we've actually eliminated the need for this kind of first pending because remember in our transaction thing, the, the raft group is actually dealing with this pending record. 
right? The, the, we're using Raft and the special nature there to actually deal with that. So we don't actually have to have a separate transaction to start this, this, this kickoff, this pending, the, the lock, if you will, on this particular transaction. We're just going to start writing these two things against these two ranges, and it's going to deal with this pending record. And when those two things come back, we're just going to commit and, and we're going to go back. And so we've actually saved you know, uh, this amount of time. Right. And so that's what we're doing with lazy pipelining. And again, it's all part of kind of how we store and how we actually execute, execute transactions. Now, parallel commits is something that we did over the past two years, um, which I find to be truly phenomenal. The only way that I could describe it in English is beyond all this stuff is, uh, you know, we couldn't change the speed of light. So we changed the photons. Uh, you know, it's like what we send over is, is different now. We basically take a, we, we take a look at a transaction. We look at all the information around it. We take a picture of that in the transaction itself. We commit on one node and we send it over to the next. And the next node says, hey, as long as the picture looks the same over here, I'm good too. And it could immediately go back and say, hey, we're going to be good. Right. And so what we're doing here, this is lazy pipeline and parallel. So we're going to do Carl, Nigel, and we're going to actually come, we're going to forward commit that thing because we actually know that it's good on one node. Right. And then what we do is when all these things come back, we're good. And so we've actually replaced this kind of centralized commit marker. We're doing Car and Nigel and then come back and then the transaction thing. We're just doing it all at once. We're basically taking everything. And as long as we're good on one side, right? The first line, and when we're, when we're all this goes over and we check on it on the other side, we can just actually say, everything's great. Send it all back. Um, that's some really, really amazing software engineering. And I think the first time I saw it was, I was kind of dumbfounded at, at, at the, what it meant for us from a performance point of view, especially in broadly distributed um, systems. When you have things that are happening, you know, in Sydney and in New York at the same time, these things really matter because we're talking about, you know, what, three or 400 millisecond round trips, you know, back and forth a couple of times, you know, you want to be sub 100 millisecond. That's really what it means to be kind of um, in real time for humans, right? I think that's that's where it's discernible for humans to be, uh, yeah, uh, real or, or, or you know, we, after that, we, we actually notice the lag, if you will, right? Okay, so I have covered uh, a lot. Um, I gave you a quick overview of Cockroach. Um, we went through our storage layer. We talked a bit about Raft. We talked about how we distribute data within the database. We spoke about distributed transactions. I went through MVCC. We talked about how distributed execution is a little bit different than basically distributing just data or, or using multiple instances of a traditional execution engine. Um, we talked about latency and the speed of light and, and how we can actually you know, do optimizations from a performance point of view for that. So the, the last thing I wanted to touch on before I, you know, I kind of end this and, and open it up for any questions, um, you know, when I first saw Cockroach, actually, I was on, it was, we were on stage. I was working at CoreOS at the time. And, uh, and if you're not familiar with CoreOS, it's kind of one of these companies, been around friends of the Linux, found, Linux Foundation and the CNCF for years and years, um, and, and kind of innovators in the Kubernetes space. They were ultimately bought by Red Hat. And, and the CEO of CoreOS, Alex Polvey, was on stage showing off Kubernetes, showing how you can kill a pod and the data and the, and the system just comes back, right? Like it's, it was awesome. And the application they used to show this off was Cockroach. And this is about four years ago. Um, and I think, you know, for me, that was the, the moment in time where I was like, wow, that's really cool. I just had a database that had a very zero, zero to very limited impact in its, in its performance. And I'm just killing off pieces of it. That, that's pretty awesome. Now, you know, fast forward a couple of years and, you know, I, I remember, you know, the federation group within you know, SIG Fed was trying to figure out, oh man, how are we going to federate Kubernetes clusters? And I think, you know, the work that people like, you know, the upbound team are doing with crossplane and, you know, there's their scupper for networking. There's a lot of stuff going on, but for me, why not just federate at the data layer? Why not just have a single logical database that's, that's going across, you know, multiple different Kubernetes clusters? And so for me, I, I find multi-region and, and global scale to be kind of the future of what we're going to do. And for us, if I could just deploy nodes across, you know, multiple different Kubernetes clusters and have them all participate and any one of those endpoints can see data in any other cluster, why worry about the, the operational nightmare of dealing with the cluster and making those things work in multi-regions? Let's just let the database deal with it. We have a demo that we did this. I know it's on our YouTube channel, uh, myself and... Uh, my friend Keith McClellan goes through a really great uh, presentation of this. I think we're going to do this one again. We're actually, we use Cube Doom to actually kill pods as well, which was kind of fun. So 
Um, that one's coming, but I, I, to me, this is, you know, probably one of the coolest things that, you know, I, I've, I've seen in this space. And I think the future is, is truly hybrid and multi-cloud. I think people, you know, they, they question it, you know, networking, uh, security, these, these things are a challenge in, in, in distributed worlds, especially across multiple different networks. But I think it'll be interesting how this, how this comes about. Right. Um, we also have a Kubernetes operator. Um, you know, while we are kind of like perfectly aligned with Kubernetes, we don't need a Kubernetes operator to do, you know, all the basic install and scale and resilience and all these things about how you find data. You know, you find other databases, really, really complex operators. For us, it's all about the day two operations and the stuff that we've learned by deploying Cockroach Cloud on Kubernetes. We have, you know, thousands of, of nodes, nodes running on Cockroach Cloud and, and it's all being you know managed by Kubernetes from an orchestration point of view. So it's kind of helping with management, the rolling upgrade stuff, uh, you know, what are the best practices around security? So we're taking basically our best practices of running Kubernetes, uh, Cockroach at scale on Kubernetes and packaging them into an operator um, available. Lots of different people using Cockroach. Uh, this is a sample of, of some of our customers. Um, you know, we often get asked, you know, you know is cockroach, cockroach is just for global workloads. I, oh my God, I don't have data all over the planet. Actually, you know, I, I would say a fair majority of our customers are using us in a single region. And that's because, you know, the, the pure elimination of any sort of, you know, of, of sharding and, and, and this kind of elastic horizontal scale that we can give to people is a huge value. Um, you know, the ability to survive any failure is just, it's, it's a phenomenal piece. And just let the database do that. So, you know, we're being used for kind of general purpose workloads and general purpose applications. And then lots of these kind of system of record where you really need this, this highest level of isolation, right? And so I think this is one of those things where, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about being distributed, you're running something on Kubernetes, we're really just containerized running in any environment. You know, Cockroach should definitely be on a list. And it's kind of one of these things that, um, that, 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 you know, I think once you see it, you can't unsee it is the funny thing that I've, I've heard from people. So um, you can learn more about Cockroach. Uh, you could take some coursework. Everything is there. It's, it's, it's all for free. Um, you know, we have some stuff on distributed databases, uh, you know, cloud native apps, uh, lots of general purpose SQL stuff, and then lots of stuff about us and how to build with Python and Java. Um, so you can go out and do that. Uh, that's, that's all available on our website. But then again, as I said, you know, as I mentioned before, I think you know, Cockroach Cloud is is really one of the easiest ways to get started. And you know, if you want to go start a cluster today, that's 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 the way to do it. So, okay, that's fifty four minutes, fifty with the intro. So I, I went through a lot. Um, I did want to actually. Uh, there was a couple of questions. I think somebody was asking about security. I think Tim answered these live. I'm not sure, um, but there's lots of things that we're doing for security within Cockroach itself. Um, you know, we, we've gone to great lengths to make sure that we have all the core kind of concepts that you would need in a database that you would expect in a normal database are in Cockroach, like all the management capabilities, you know, integration with other things, you know, how do you actually, you know, we actually improved our logging. So it works a lot better with things like Splunk and Datadog in, in the last release, you know, we don't set this up with a Prometheus endpoint, right? And so lots of different things that we're doing around the core of the database to make it work the way you work. Security being one of those things, you know, how do we integrate with LDAP? Um, you know, secrets management within this. Um, you know, do we, you know, we encrypt data at rest and data in motion. Um, this is all TLS between, you know, different endpoints and whatnot. So there's lots of things that we're doing. If you want to deep dive into all the kind of co components of security we've implemented in this, again, I, I just, I always push people towards our docs. I think they're a phenomenal resource. The team does an amazing, amazing job um, um, doing these sort of things. So. Uh, let's see. Uh, any other questions? There was there was a lot of questions, and thank you, Tim, for jumping in and doing all this and 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 reading this and and answering these questions. I I'll, I'll go through a couple of them just to kind of talk through them. I have a minute or two. Um, somebody was asking for uh, you know, do we support spatial data? Um, yes, we actually uh, implemented those libraries in Cockroach itself as well. So we actually do now support spatial data. Um, in a distributed database, um, which has actually added added some interesting kind of um, concepts there. Um, so we're actually doing that as well. There was a security question. Um, I think I got almost everything. Somebody was asking about bulk loading um, and and how we actually do that. 
Um, yeah, we do. We do actually uh, provide bulk lading capabilities. Um, but I think it's, we think about it in terms of the backup and restore capabilities and the, the batching capabilities that we have. You know, I know our, our IO team thinks a lot about these things. Um, I, I think my best answer again is go to the, go to our docs. I think there's lots of information there on this as well. So let's see. Yeah. I think I've answered everything else. Um, unless there's not any other questions. I mean, that was, that was a lot of information in a little bit of time. Um, I do hope this was, uh, valuable to everybody. I, I hope that, you know, you know, this wasn't just, you know, just cockroach talking about cockroach and try to make this a little bit more about, you know, the, some of the principles that we use and the underlying architecture to hopefully, you know, open your eyes to some of the things that are out there and some of the things to actually look at. So um, again, I'm, I'm Jim Walker. I'm just at James, J-A-Y-M-C-E on Twitter. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions. You know, our, our Cockroach community Slack channel is, is an extremely vibrant community. Lots of people asking and answering questions there. Um, but, you know, for me, go out and try it if you're interested in this sort of thing. And then if you're looking for a PhD in distributed systems, I still contend that that our, our code base is, is a good place to, to, to do this. So on behalf of, uh, you know, our, our entire company and a lot of people who worked really hard on a lot of really cool stuff here, um, thank you for joining us. And thank you to the Linux Foundation for having us today. Have a great day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim, for your time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be up on our Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye.